my friends, most characters, I don't know if people. And this morning's video is about anger. Type 8 in a Negro is the angry type. And it's certainly in my tri type to be angry. I use anger a lot to good effect in a lot of different areas of my life. And sometimes I use it to poor effect. The thing about anger is, it's how we feel issues of justice. But being angry is not a very reliable indicator of whether or not something is actually just. Actually, we get Kimberly out like. Sorry for the short break there. So, yeah, anger. Here's the thing about Enneagram types. One thing I like about Enneagram a lot is the way in which it's consistent with and compatible with the cognitive function model and addresses different aspects of the self. So, I can be an ENTP, and it means I'm most likely going to be a 7, because 7 is the type that wants to play all the time. And they hide away from issues by sticking their head in the sand and keep playing, fiddling while Rome burns. Nero was probably an ENTP. Or at least a type 7. <laughs> um, but just because you're an HP doesn't mean you're necessarily a type 7. And regardless, your primary Enneagram type is something that I don't think really changes over the course of your life. But uh, it doesn't represent the entirety of your dealing with shit. So. My second number in my chart type, or my first, the wing of my first number, as well, is eight. Uh, eight means my first reaction to conflict or dispute is to get angry, and basically, the way that anger works is it can base the other party your seriousness and it says I'm not going to allow you to proceed without a fight now fortunately we live in a, a time period that's somewhat beyond the need for substantial physical strength to sustain one's person and property. So, as a consequence, the fights that comprise my expression of anger, anyway, are all verbal. So, hello. Hi, Womb Dang Glan. Uh, 
I ain't nothing to fuck with. No, you aren't. No. You're the Womb Tang clan. You run the uterus inside. Yep. Uh, so anyway, I'm talking about anger today. Casual. Talking about being angry and the need for anger and also the ways in which anger can lead you astray. So, <coughs> like I said, <coughs> anger is how we feel injustice. And so it's natural and good and appropriate that people become angry at instances of injustice. Otherwise, nobody's ever going to be held accountable for anything. The fact is, people who have nefarious intentions and, and bad behaviors, they are moving forward with their ways in accordance with their own interests and their own lack of moral culpability. The only way to stop bad individuals from making it impossible for decent individuals to function freely is anger. is anger. We have to be legitimately outraged by that shit. And this is one of the reasons why it's frustrating to me when people are angry about the wrong things. Angry about make-believe shit. Angry at Trump for for pointing out accurately that there was violence on both sides of that dispute in Charlottesville. So th this seems to me like maybe why that you get um, more, you, when you get angry when you're having a debate with somebody so, and you can't see why other people have a problem with that because you have legitimized anger in this way and given it this value. So when you're projecting it, you don't understand why people have a problem. Well, that's generally true, I'd say, but um, that's kind of why I'm making these videos. I'm growing a bit in that area, thanks to Kimberly. Because one thing that I've discovered is that anger simply does not work with her. It is an impossibly bad way to get her to be more reasonable. So the reason for that is, like you, she has F.E. in the second slot, Jethro. So that means tone is very important to her. And if I'm saying the same thing in a um, I guess respectful tone, that I'm saying in an angry tone, that makes a huge difference to Kimberly. It, she's not, she doesn't pay as much attention to the content as I do, and she pays a lot more attention to the tone than I do. So in the interaction uh, itself, right? She sees it as a as an exchange between two people, where I tend to see it as an exchange between ideas. And so, right. because it, it may be, I mean, when you're talking about when you were giving your outline of anger there and it being an important thing, the um, I went to a Buddhist center, uh, a temple nearby, and they were giving a teaching and they were saying that anger has no positive benefits. Right, and right. uh, their right. teaching was that from a good heart comes good results. However, the, that I, I so I thought about that because I was like, well, how can you, you know, you, anger is something that happens when you, like you say, you know, you see you have an injustice happen. Um, but again, there was a a rabbi that I was listening to on YouTube last night talking about anger. Actually, he said some good thing about love as well, but he was talking about anger and that there's stages. He was talking about three stages. One is where you're feeling it. Do you know what I mean? You've taken the anger, you, you have that anger inside. The second is the expression of it. Now, you'll agree with me, won't you, that the expression of anger is different than the anger itself. It's a qualitative, it's a, it's a different phenomenon. Right, and a lot of times, whether or not the anger is good or bad, or purposeful or purposeless, or productive or counterproductive, is going to depend on how it's expressed. Right, because you don't need to express the anger 
in a violent manner and you know going towards the violent end of the scale i mean you could say that you know in some kind of passive aggressive way someone was being angry by you know demanding your rights in congress or whatever but that's not what somebody else would uh, you know take on as I, I believe is anger they would believe that i was just putting forward a moral precept and uh, you know arguing it and debating it they wouldn't call that angry right well i think anger is most useful when it's a natural response to an attempted transgression so if somebody's trying to like for example when my landlord tried to tell me i owed him the difference between the last month's rent that i paid when i moved in and the current cost of the rent. So he's like saying, I know you paid last month's rent when you moved in, but that doesn't actually count as last month's rent. That goes towards last month's rent, and um, and you have to make up the difference. Well, the answer to that is anger, because, of course, it's a ridiculous claim. It's a ridiculous <laughs> idea that I would have to do that. And the guy's just trying to fuck me, you know? So my reaction was, um, no, I'm not. And I think it's ridiculous that you, you are attempting to make this claim. And then he was like, well, 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 I went back and forth and tried to, tried to argue with me a bit. And tried to make threats and stuff, saying like, well, but you've damaged the house and I'll take pictures. I said, take your fucking pictures. What are you going to do with them? Post them to your Facebook page? You're going to try to sue me? Good luck, motherfucker. I've been living here for 20 years. That was an appropriate outburst of anger for me. And it made it clear to him that there was no ground there for him. And that I was not somebody to play with. So, that was absolutely an appropriate use of anger because it put in check somebody who was attempting to transgress against me. And that's the most appropriate use of anger. Now, there's anger about concepts like I might be angry about um, this. I'm angry. I'm angry about them prosecuting this defense attorney in San Diego, and I'm frustrated that the prosecutors and police and other law and order types are pushing through their own agenda against the will of the voters of California. But the thing is, I'm going to be angry about that, but a lot of people aren't going to see that as anger because I'm not going to be displaying a lot of anger unless I get rolling in a rant and then, you know, I might display what looks like anger. But there's a big difference for me also between real anger and and debate anger. Sometimes debate anger becomes real anger, but debate anger is usually something that has zero stickiness to me. So I might be screaming at you one second and be perfectly happy the next because it's just debate anger. Yeah, I mean, it's debate anger, though. D depending on who you're talking to, you're going to find people, you know, uh, are willing to tolerate or f view it as acceptable. You know, it's like if I came into the room and just and just I was just I was just angry and I was just like, Eric, you're a piece of shit. Now, let's talk about this crap that you want to talk about now. You know, if I had that demeanor in other kinds of interactions and i was just like oh well don't don't hold it against me i was just you know it's just the way i talk you cunt you know it wouldn't be received well uh i just want to go back to your interaction with your landlord though um you said that you expressed you expressed anger um but like i say there's some kind of wedge here between um rel you know relative expression of uh, the violence sort of uh, sentiment, if you will. Um, because you could have said to your landlord in a perfectly calm tone of voice, uh, well, it seems to me, uh, uh, you know, you can comment upon what you think you might have got away with, but it seems to me that you could 
speak to your landlord who was trying to bilk you and say, no, I've lived here, that's uh, fair use, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm going to collect my money. You could have said it in a calm and assertive tone of voice. You could have also said it the way you did and it turned out just the same in that occasion. But had you had to take it to court and express the same anger, do you know what I mean? It wouldn't have been well, as well received and you wouldn't have been able to get the outcome that you got because of the relationship that you had in the situation. But, but you were able to you're missing angry. the point. The reason I was angry is has to do with the fact that I was right and he was wrong. So if I went to court and expressed that same anger, it's irrelevant because the law is on my side, decency is on my side, and common sense is on my side. So the fact that I expressed anger I, was doing him a service. I was telling him, you're wrong, and you should never try to pull this shit on anybody again. No, you, you're presupposing that, to my mind, that, that you would have won any effective. kind of... I don't know if it was effective, but it was more effective than not teaching him the lesson. And he definitely deserved to be shamed. And he did feel ashamed by the time I was done with him. And that was good. Well, if you say so, my, my point here is that... Um, uh, do you understand my point? About yeah, your point is that, that the expression of anger can be counterproductive, which is exactly where I was heading with this video anyway, which is it can be counterproductive, and it depends what your relationship with the person is and what your goals are. So, for example, the reason I'm making a video about anger at all is because it's so counterproductive with Kimberly. Normally, people realize when somebody's very angry and concurrently making all good points this is the thing what you say matters too so normally if I'm angry and yelling at somebody um, the problem that they have is what I'm yelling are extremely reasonable correct and accurate sentences I'm not, I may be thrown as a profanity in there too, and yet my points re remain extremely reasonable, considered, accurate, and correct. And so they really have a big problem because the only thing they can ever attack me on is my tone. And but when well, they do, no, you, when you're they presupposing do, I that, Eric. You know, do, I, you, I don't think, I, I don't think it's necessarily helpful for you to come at this from like, hey, I'm always right. But if you want me to... to hey, Castro, you know, listen. Listen, this is, the, this is the tricky reality I have, which is I'm not always right at all by any stretch of the imagination. But what people don't realize is that I've already conceded all the points that they were correct about right away. And then they forget about that fact. And, they, and then they say, well, Eric, you're always, you think you're always right. No, I conceded all the parts where I was wrong. All that's left are the parts where you are wrong, and you're not. No, because either. because you, what what you're doing there is you're creating a, an aggressive doesn't emotional matter, environment. It doesn't for, matter if it's aggressive for for people to ex doesn't for people matter. to exploit. It does because when you I think when you express anger, um, depending on uh, where feelings are going to be in your stack and what have you and what type. Um, you're going to generate hormone releases which cloud thinking. They don't cloud and, mind. Uh, they don't cloud mind. That's the thing. Well, you're not in a world. Yeah, okay. Well, you, here's the deal. You'll accept you're not I, in a world of Eric's. I, I am. I do accept that. I accept that I'm not in a world of Eric's. And that's where I'm getting with this, but I'm trying to set up the reality, which is, unfortunately, on some level, I am pretty much unique among people, although not entirely unique. I've seen some others who are equivalencies of meta-rationalism that I'm, I have legitimately sufficient detachment from my ideas that I'm never going to defend something that doesn't sustain, doesn't, doesn't sustain or withstand TI scrutiny. So as a consequence, there are moments when I cling to wrongness in personal things occasionally but I'm really, really good at objective self-criticism. So I don't generally do that at all. And as a consequence, it's very frustrating to people because it, they view it as Eric thinks he's always right. Eric always has to win. But the reality is 
Eric's engaged in the proper process of argumentation and parsing of things. So as a consequence, he doesn't cling to any wrong ideas. There's no reason. To. Oh, but you just said you did. I, I, I occasionally with with personal things I said. And you wouldn't know. No, I do know because I exist in time. So even if in the moment I see myself having clung to something, I can recognize that later in my postmortem analysis, which is objective. But you're having the you're having the argument in the moment, and you're expressing an, a wrong it's idea to someone in an aggressive way. Here's the, here's the mechanism you're not accounting the, for. Here's the, the mechanism emotional. you're not accounting for. I don't repeat playing the same mistakes multiple times. So as a consequence, as I've gotten older, I have fewer and fewer wrongnesses within me. You're just um, you're just kind of trying to obfuscate the margin there. No, you, you know, you have, you have to. Castro, I'm, I'm doing the difficult work of of accurately describing my status quo reality before I can talk about how my anger does not serve you. And you are. You are. Me. You're only Castro, I know. Castro, get it. I get it. It's a, it's a thing where it's like, this is not good FE. I'm not supposed to talk about my own abilities and skills and stuff like that. I get that. But I'm trying to actually do a descriptively it's not that. It's precise. Not that. I get that, I'm but I'm trying to do a descriptively precise analysis here, <laughs> and you're not allowing me to do it. I suspect what you're doing is trying to get me to display anger since the video is about anger. But at this point, not I would actually all. like to go forward with my analysis. So if you'll allow me to do so, I'd appreciate it. Thank not you. Go for it. So anyway, um, given the state of affairs, I I have had a lot more success with <laughs> anger than most people. In other words, most people, anger gets them in trouble in ways that it doesn't get me in trouble. So as a consequence, when I come into this relationship with Kimberly, I come equipped with my normal tool set, which includes a very effective um, version of an Ebram Type A. So a lot of people tell me I'm intimidating, though I don't feel that way. But people who get to know me for a while real don't feel intimidated by me at all. So like one of the things that's happened with Kimberly is I've learned her approach to responding to my anger. And it I could be saying the exact same thing in a different tone, and it's gonna have a very, very different effect on her. And the thing about this is, unlike most people in the world, I'm not okay with my default mechanism being applied to Kimberly. My default mechanism is this. I am not looking to achieve efficiency and outcomes on your behalf when I'm angry at you. So in other words, the, the good deed that I do is you learn that that argument is hot and you try not to touch it again because you just got burned by it. Now, that's not a mechanism I want to use to deal with Kimberly at all, because while it's effective enough in the sense that it does improve the uh, it does improve discourse over time to uh, slam bad arguments, it doesn't improve relationships. <laughs> so uh, here's the thing: people can be you can present to others ways to get them to loosen their their attachment to their ideas a bit if they're bad ideas but you have to do it in a way that maximizes the amount of dignity they feel in the process rather than minimizes it so in other words if i want kimberly to come around it needs to be a positive process for her and not a, a risk avoidant process. I don't mind if I make others bad argument risk avoidant. That's fine. But I don't want to make her bad argument risk avoidant. I want her to come to embrace fairness as a virtue by seeing me model it not only in my my uh, words but in my tone as well. So. In this instance, anger has been an absolute nightmare because when I get angry with Kimberly, first of all, she's pretty much terrible at relationship communication. So if you've got a relationship dispute, Kimberly does not know how to talk shit out at all. 
and so it goes like this. It goes, uh, Kimberly, I want to talk to you about blah, because that seems kind of unfair. And then she, stop! Don't ah! <laughs> She's like, don't, don't talk to me! Doesn't want to talk about anything difficult, right? And then, um, and then we start down this thing where she just starts saying ridiculous things, like, well, you always, you always throw your trash all over the floor. Make me pick it up. And what she's referring to is like, I dropped one napkin and left it there five minutes ago, you know, or something like that. It's, it's insane. So, um, I, at first I was reactive to it and I just would be like, Kimberly, that is not true. You know, and, and we would get in this fight, fight about me basically trying to scold the shit out of her for all these ridiculous statements she was making for each one in succession. It was just like, you cannot possibly think that's true. That's insane. Um, what I realized after having spent the last four days of so fighting with her is, uh, I mean, not yesterday, but I saw a little bit until yesterday, even. but, um, is that there's no, I cannot win that way. She will tit for tat us to Armageddon, and she will um, just shut down. So it's like if I say, "But Kimberly, if what you just said is true, then that means that you have to go to jail for the rest of your life." So just be like, "Then I have to go to jail for the rest of my life." Man, too bad. Well, I guess you just can't trust me then. Well, I guess I'm just a horrible person. Like that shit, you know. <laughs> So, anyway, I, there, I just, I kept trying to get mad at her for being not reasonable enough, right? For being totally unreasonable. And what I realize now is she is matching my tone and ignoring my words. Why? Because my tone is too angry. So, um, I'm resolved to simply not get angry with her anymore. I'm just going to not be reactive. And if she says ridiculous, unfair shit, I'm just going to look at her and say, we'll talk about this later. And walk away. <laughs> she, she knows that She's got a lot of work to do in this area. It, this, this is what happens when you have, you're a 46 year old woman and you haven't been in a good relationship in your entire life. I mean, I've been in mostly iffy relationships too, but I never experienced I mean, I always had excellent communication skills because in my family, when I was growing up, the way I was raised was that when a fight was over or the way fights would end is we'd like cool down, me and whichever parent would cool down. And then there'd be an exchange of accountability where each party would say, okay, mom, look, I'm, it was my bad that I said sentence X when I was yelling at you earlier. And I'm really sorry about that. I shouldn't have said that. And then she'll say, okay, well, Eric, it was my fault that I did blah, 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 blah. And I shouldn't have. That's how all of our fights ended. So, of course, I have incredibly good relationship communication skills because my parents were so unbelievably fair and just with me all the time. Kimberly didn't have that experience. Her stepfather was abusive. <coughs> and uh, her relationships have been... They just haven't worked. You know? Mine haven't either. But mine were not plagued by bad communication skills. You know, Candace and I 
communicated very effectively, especially in the divorce. There's a video on talking with famous people where it's basically, it's, I think it's audio only, but it's a conversation between me and Candace in which Candace is basically saying, finalizing the fact that we're going to split. And I'm saying, but can't we do this? Can't we do that? She's like, no, I'm leaving. So, but we talked it out before she left. But when, when it was pretty clear we were going to get divorced, we both agreed that it wouldn't happen until both of us were ready all the way. Like, we'd talk it through. I'm very grateful to her for that. That's funny, I haven't gotten emotional about that relationship in a long time. But when I think back to that video, it's so, uh, it's so emotionally charged. It's hard not to reflect on it and get emotional. Anyway. Anger is part of this spectrum of, yeah, I made coffee. It's in the pot. Uh, the spectrum of emotion thing. As an ENTP, I don't understand my own feelings very well. That's ever more obvious to me that I often don't get when I'm feeling things. I have to pay attention to the fact that why I am as I am has a lot to do with my feelings, my mood, and my happy, sad quotient or something. <laughs> so do you think that, that over time, basically, you've had, in order to sort of mitigate that, like that unwieldiness that you've grown a larger acceptance around things, uh, emotional states, such as anger? Well, um, I'm pretty accepting of a lot of shit. Like, I, I'm pretty... I'm not going to... I don't really judge people. I judge ideas a lot. I do I occasionally judge people. But I'll be judging somebody who's done a behavior that is not okay according to my, one of my standards it's like like I judge Kimber's aunt for being a scumbag and I judge uh, I judge the sheriff in Pratt, Kansas for being a scumbag but uh, by and large I don't judge people very much I'm not going to be like can you believe that they did blah 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 you know, it, I don't just have that because I I like a world in which ideas are detached from people. I'm a debate coach. I I exist in a world where my students and other students around me and other coaches and me and stuff are used to arguing passionately a and then the next round arguing just as passionately not a. I'm trained to be detached from the ideas that I'm arguing and to evaluate the arguments on their merits without consideration of my own position on things. And as a consequence, I I only sort of have positions on things. I I do have some positions on important things. I obviously I pr promote and advocate for and believe in to the extent that, that means anything. A rights-based framework as a preferable meta framework for understanding public policy to any other while acknowledging that it, it does not provide a perfect recipe or anything. So in that regard, I tend to to qualify or position my positions as relative. Like, well, I believe this is the best of the available alternatives is a much better claim to make than 
this is the ultimate truth. Let me pull this bong rip and uh, I'll resume this wonderful discussion with Castro about anger in a minute. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to continue if, I, if I'm going to make you angry, though. Uh, uh, if I, I don't want to make you angry. I don't think you're going to make me angry. I mean... The thing is... I'm very accustomed to... The... To dividing out the... Mishmash of T... I and F E that TIFE users always present. So, there's a shit ton of argumentation that's done. It's, it's a lot of words that are cloaking F-E miaz, you know? Like, it, I mean, this is true of lots and lots of people. Like, I've had these sort of things with Susie where she just can't stand the FE quality of something I'm saying, and so she starts she starts uh, attacking it in ways that are designed to attribute the content itself to FE stuff. This is the thing. It's important to remember that that even the even the uh, the murderer. Even the rapist, even the criminals and the despots and the potheads, potheads and everybody in the world, when they make a claim and support it with a warrant, talk about an impact, those claims, warrants, and impacts are things that if we want to think well, we have to evaluate independent of the person who said them. And we have to evaluate them independent of the way in which they were said. And we have to evaluate them independent of our FE respective positioning things. So in other words, we have to detach ourselves from the social situation. We have to detach uh, ourselves from our perspective on the other person, and we have to detach ourselves from our perspective on our relative relationship to the other person. So, if we can do all those things, then we end up finding ourselves begrudgingly acknowledging lots of stuff. And then, eventually, one stops begrudgingly acknowledging stuff because one's positions have been shaped to be as defensible as possible and as uh, airtight as possible to withstand, at, to withstand as much TI scrutiny as possible such that um, independently of the individual saying them, they are better arguments. Um. In principle, to some degree, one on some subjects, because you are going to be a, you're going to take a subject that has relevance to people and to feelings, and you're going to create a bunch of TI logic which says you're wrong for feeling this. And I never say that. I never say that. No, I'm not saying that you say it. I'm just saying that in the in the pursuit of a of a TI solution. Um, you know, you, you're going to end up with, um, TI objective, you know, goals. And, uh, we're not just thinking, I think that this is where the feeling issue regards the, uh, emotional reality of humanity. And, 
it's an inescapable thing. And this is testament to, and I'll, t- I'll say this, this is testament to this fact that in principle, TI is where you want to go with everything. But I learned long ago that that's not how you win arguments in a public setting. Well, I guess the key thing here is um, there's no disputing that emotion is ultimately the soul of humanity. Nothing I do matters except insofar as I relate to it emotionally in some sense. Uh, And that's true for everybody. And it's also the case that there's a lot of different kinds of impacts one can attain by making arguments. You talked about winning arguments in the public sphere. In this kind of argumentation where it's not, there's no judges and there's no timings and it's sort of ongoing, endless uh, parsing out of various claims and such, one can claim to win or lose an argument. You know, one, can, one can claim to win an argument with somebody, but it's really missing the point because, again, what we're talking about are sentences and sentences that people say. If I make a sentence that says this, we should make a law that mandates children wear helmets when outside of the house to prevent head injuries. All children have to wear helmets outside of the house at all times to prevent head injuries. If I make that claim, it's a sentence, then the thing about the emotion is the emotion of that sentence is basically in, it's to be found in the fact that children are at risk of, of harm And this person is proposing a solution to that. It, on that level, is emotionally rewarding. At the same time, for those of another perspective, it would resonate as impositional and unnecessary. And the application of force according to the will of one person upon the will of other people and would find it, therefore, emotionally, maybe make you angry or or make you sad or something like that. So the emotional component is important, but the problem is we have to remember where emotion is king and where emotion is subordinate. So while it may be the soul of humanity, we don't want to allow emotional appeals like my child was walking down the sidewalk and tripped over a a, tripped over a root and cracked his head open and died and now I'm here to pass Ryan's law Ryan's law says (laughs) we will have helmets for all children at all times when they're out of the house or offending (laughs) parents will pay a big fine yeah, most most people aren't going to be. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying about the uh, uh, the differentiation there. Um, most people are still going to be won back over by an emotional argument, as in like, "What the fuck are you talking about? That's overkill." And that'll probably just <laughs> just that sentence alone will appeal to most people's sensibilities because they've lived a life where they've not had to do that, you know, and they've not fallen over and banged the head. I mean, an exact corollary of what you're talking about is the video nasties and censorship in the UK, where we allegedly had someone killing, uh, we had two kids killing another kid, a younger kid, and it was, they, the prosecution, uh, the defense blamed it on uh, the Chucky movies, and so we had a load of movies banned from the UK. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. This is why we. it's important for any state to have a constitution that protects free speech, for one thing. But additionally, it's important for a people to have some concept of what their position on shit is. It's like, 
why is it okay to ban those movies and not others? Why there's no TI defense for this sort of thing, right? It doesn't sustain any it doesn't withstand why do I keep saying sustain? Sustain and withstand. It doesn't withstand any scrutiny. You know, because if it to, to withstand scrutiny means it is logically consistent with our values and our policies and our stuff like that. And it just isn't. It's not logically consistent with your values or your policies. Because to be logically consistent would mean one, you're conceding that a movie is causing people to kill other people, and yet it clearly is not. If it were causing people to kill other people, then why is it not the case that when I watch the movie, I kill somebody? Okay. And and nobody nobody is even. Yeah, it, it, yeah, and it's not like it. And just claim like, well, there's a, a, a correlation, you know, that people who watch a lot of more of these movies are a little bit more likely to do violent things or something. I mean, that's the most ridiculous thing in the world. Because how many different qualities or how many different things could you match up with? It's, it's, the it's government more, banned the movies? It's moronic. It, it's moronic to say these media objects are causing people to do things. It, it, people's action and choices are are the consequence, are the emergent consequence of a bunch of different fucking factors and phenomena. Now, the only, most people have a very limited amount of free will, which is to say, they don't metacognate a whole bunch. And really, free will is metacognition. Free will is the ability to not default to your habitual nature. So... How how can anybody think that's a good idea? It's so stupid. We're gonna ban movies because okay, there's a murder. The murderers make up some shit. Oh yeah, we murdered because um uh because uh, the uh, the maple trees there's. There are a lot of maple trees around here, and we both hate maple syrup. And, and everyone goes, <gasps> Maple trees <laughs> cause mur murder! No, you fucking idiots! Maple trees don't cause murder! They're just making that shit up! You know, what's funny, though, is that the organization that's banning a movie that they say promotes violence is the most violent organization ever conceived, government. Well, I mean, it's... Just saying. Just throwing that out there. There's only one meaningful definition of government, by the way, which is that agency that has a monopoly on use of force. That's true. A monopoly on legal violence is like, or legal crime is like, the well, my, my favorite definition is, uh, you know, the winning gang. Yeah, the biggest gang in the region. <sighs> kidnapping? No, it's not kidnapping. It's arrest. Slavery? No, it's not slavery. It's conscription. It's the draft. Theft? Yeah, no, I'm Jeremy, sorry. It's not theft. It's taxation. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the bulger, the, the band, movies, plenty of movies were banned before um, uh, that case, but uh, that sort of made sure that uh, a bunch of movies stayed banned. Um, it was Jamie Bulger. I mean, I'm looking into it now, and like a lot of things, like there was Jamie another Bulger. case of... Uh, Who's Jamie Bulger? Yeah, uh, Jamie Bulger was allegedly, because, uh, you know, I think, uh, I know a lot of these things have been hoaxed, but uh, a little ginger kid, about four years old or something like that, got murdered by two kids that were like 10 and 11 or something like that. I think I got them taken out of a shopping center and murdered on a train tracks or something. Yeah, I heard about that. I read, I, yeah. 
Did those two like ten year olds? Do they have gunships? Did they have what? Sorry, gunships. Gunships. <laughs> <laughs> Did they have F-14s and bombs? And <laughs> Did they blow the shit out of the four year old? <laughs> I knew I stayed up all night for a reason. They, those two boys, killed somebody. They killed a four year old child. <laughs> Meanwhile, the government's just fucking the video still bombing on. the shit out of these villages full of children. Ooh, let's let's bomb the toddlers today. For freedom. You know Dude, what we should freedom. do? We should bomb those toddlers. Here's some underwear. <laughs> Which underwears do I like, says Kimberly? I don't want to wear any of those underwears, Kimberly. What what kind of what are they? They have a hole in the front of them. <laughs> Are those the weird things? They are weird. That's good a good. Lord. That's a good way to get people to freaking click on something. It's that weird ass picture. That what the hell are those? We should we should download that picture and do that. We should seal that. Hey, Eric. Idea. Eric, you remember that Judas Priest crap in the 80s where those kids got and killed somebody and it was alleged that it was because of a Judas Priest album and whatnot? Sorry, Where's all the rest of the murders on account of, a, of, the, of that same Judas Priest album? It's been like 30 fucking years. Right. <laughs> you think that would have been the beginning of something, right? They're but coming, no. Jer Jeremy. They're coming. You know what? Just a you know what's the worst thing? is because we haven't had any other murders... In 30 years, there's a backlog. So we're going to get like a rush, like 50 murders all at once pretty soon. So it's like, like the garden hose in the Warner Brothers cartoons where they're holding it and it's like expanding in a sphere. Yeah, okay. I got you. I got you. In Dungeons and Dragons, let's not forget that. Yeah. Dungeons and Dragons is, <laughs> is a soul stealer. It's a soul stealer is what it is. I mean, the thing you still is, do a video. We, yeah, when you think back to, to all the things that people got uh, morally and and just sort of can spiritually panicked about, it's it's crazy that anybody would yeah, ever right. think that's a good idea. You know, Al Gore's wife, Tipper Gore, was leading the crusade against uh, profane lyrics and music. Uh, or talking to you know, like how well has that worked out, Tipper? How how well has your campaign against uh, against indecency panned out? Have you listened to any popular music lately? <laughs> it's all like my penis slides in your vagina. That's what it's mostly about. Anyway, um, and viewers at home. Right now, my metaphysical penis is sliding into your <laughs> metaphysical vagina. As the oh, is that what that is? I, yes, I was I'm wondering. Right as these dulcet tones speak I don't words mind. of wisdom and truth across the pipes of Not the internet. Metaphysical rape, though. No, you're very, very I'm... willing. Dude, I didn't say that. Castro, you are willing and ready. Oh, yeah. No. No. Come on, Castro. Give it the program. You have to go, Kimberly. <laughs> Goodbye. I love you. Kimberly, I'm not angry at you. This video today, I'm live streaming about the subject of anger. Yeah. Castro and I have been talking about it. Jeremy and I. Jeremy just got here a little while ago. Free will is what now, says Garrett Hurt? Free will is the ability to not default to your habitual natures. What? We use free will? Yeah. That's a fucking excellent point. That's exactly what I'm going to do. I use free will when I get angry and not default to my habitual nature of being angry with you only. I'll just be the same with everybody else. But, uh, I mean, is it fair to summarize this video as it's important to be civil in your in your interactions with people, especially 
those people who you're in a relationship with because you're not always right. In other words, who are next to you while you sleep. I think it's important to be civil, yeah. I, look, the thing is, I am, <laughs> I am not... I'm not always willing to concede this point with you, Kessel, but it's true. It's important to be civil. In general, I should probably curtail the indulgence that I indulge in of, um, <laughs> no, of, of a certain kind of... Do you know why, Do you know why, Eric? So let, me, let me tell you this. Your civil side... That's your best side. It looks good on you, man. It's true. Okay. I've been getting it a lot is. of this lecture lately you from have. a lot of people. So. All right. Okay, okay. 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 My grandmother. <laughs> can, can, I, can I please talk to Garrett Hurt? He's asking, he's saying some good shit here in the chat. I want to talk about Okay. I message, I message her. Okay. Garrett, That's what makes people Garrett Hurt. Garrett's being napalmed with truth. I know, right. Garrett Hurt says, how do you make this go up or down? Anyway, Garrett Hurt says, uh, wait, hold up. Free will is what now? And then I answered him. And Elsie says, 50-50 chance, Eric. We'll check, check the chat. Well, 50-50 means half the time I do, and this is half that half the time. Garrett Hurt says, is your metacognition not an emergent property and or a property of your default nature? Well, I'm not talking about default nature. I'm talking about habits and manners of attention so you habitually default to certain manners of attention and your ability to default to other manners of attention are uh, your ability to not go to that default manner of attention but rather step back and consider and decide on a manner of attention is ultimately free will so for example i've been experiencing exactly this phenomenon i'm talking about with all around the house here doing shit with the garage tools just generally getting shit together here because I have been running I have been wrestling with my NE essentially and trying to get myself to um, be more efficient be more effective and stop assess consider decide a course of action follow through on it that's not my default nature. I said that the time before too, Garrett. You're right, I did say that. But I mean, my default nature is, what I mean by that is my persistent habit of preferring certain manners of attention in certain circumstances. And my tendency to, like, if I go into the garage and there's a bunch of tools, a bunch of fun things to play with, my natural tendency is to not consider how the how can I get this project done most effectively, but how, how am I going to be happy about this most when it's done? It's how am I going to be happy most right now to play around with these things? Oh, I could try to screw these screws in with this thing. Is this fucking stupid idea, right? I, I, I don't have the screwdriver that I, I need right in front of me. Oh, I'll try to. I'll try to make it work with this other thing that's right in front of me rather than get up and walk over there and get the right screwdriver. Some shit like that. Having free will means, for me, not being a slave to uh, my reflexive attention, my reflexive urges being a metaphysical actor first and foremost is my dominant function my reflex when encountering things is to have fun with them and indulge in what i feel like in the moment so i've got to i as i've metacognated more about it and understand cognitive functions and all that other stuff uh I've determined, I've, I've become better at shit like that, you know, I've, I've been improved. Now, the question that's interesting there is, is my metacognition a function of my, of my habitual manners of attention? Yeah, I guess. It's a function of, or it's, a, it's an outcome of the, uh, the combination of nurture and nature. So, 
my nature, so to speak, is to habitually manifest certain manners of attention in a certain relationship to each other. That's that's my configuration, we would call it. Nurture is is the unique particular SI stuff that comprises my ontology over time. So in other words, I know who I am. This is one of the What? Oh, you can see the phone? Not only can I not look at it, not <laughs> Okay, well, where can, uh, did you go anywhere yesterday? We went to, with me to the... Well... Alright, so, I may have to get up in a second and help Kimberly look for her phone, but, uh... What was I just saying before that? Oh yeah, metacognition. So, yeah, is it an emergent function of my? It's, it, yeah, it, it's a. I don't know. It's it exists because of a combination of nature and nature. I will help you look for your phone. In the meantime, would you like to use my phone to play more? No, I need to find my phone so I can meet. How are you doing, Ketchko? Hey, Jeremy. I'm doing okay. How are you? Being a little antsy, actually. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's tomorrow, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Do you have your outfit ready? Well, I thought I did until my wife told me I didn't. <laughs> how does that work? <laughs> my wife tells me that I don't. That's how that shit works. All right. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to wear? Well, I'm going to wear my tactical pants and maybe a blazer. And then I met with all of the reasons why that's not a good idea. So, okay. Yeah. Um, do you know what other people are wearing? <laughs> no. <laughs> Ask your mate then, and sort of, you know, because uh, you could sort of not coordinate. But if ever, you know, it's like if everyone's going to a black tie ball, you know, the then. Well, the the thing is, you see, the thing is, the people that are coming are treating it like it's their biggest thing. Yeah. So, past experience does not necessarily apply. I don't, I'm not expecting them to show up in their finest overalls. Uh, I don't get you. What are you expecting from them? Well, see, I don't really know. I mean, I, I could show up as like the most dapper person on the red carpet. On one hand, on the other hand, I could show up looking like some trash that thinks it's a free buffet and is worming his way into the situation. I, I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't really want to expect yeah. um, I think it's hard enough for actual celebrities, isn't it? You know, who do these things on a regular basis. You want to get a, a, a feel for how the other people are dressing, really. Otherwise, you're just going to not know, and that'll be weird. Well, I've seen pictures of past instances of this where the same people are showing up and like one person is virtually in a tuxedo and the person next to them is in jeans 
So it's like, it's like, wow, well, shit, it's quite a range there. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about anger here before we call it a live stream, which we probably will in about 15 right now. Right now, I'm, in, I'm enjoying uh, this conversation a lot, so I don't see any reason to end it, but I would like to try to stay on topic a bit. Don't jinx it, says Elsie. Speaking of anger. Wow, a chat. Hi, hi Mega Bro. You are... Uh, Highly valued and respected member of the community, <laughs> um, a beast among beasts. So, in order to truly choose something, there has to be a choice between two things. In order, in other words, you have to be able to do two different things. But ultimately, we are an emergent phenomenon of what? That's an excellent summary right there. And we are an emergent phenomenon of a confluence of of factors that comprise uh, basically the intersection of a bunch of different agents who are acting metaphysically and or physically in the world. Our own self-concept or ontology, which is built out of SI or NI understandings of things. So I, I think that basically the, the ontological self-concept of somebody who's in introverted intuitor is going to be built of negative space. They know the world and know themselves as that which is not the world. And the SI user, introverted sensor, uh, is going to know the world the opposite way. So they're gonna they're gonna know themselves and they learn about the world from their self point. And I don't remember what I'm, oh, I was going to look at the chat to see what I was responding to. Okay, no. So I've got a terrible memory, obviously. Metacognition is centered within oneself and consists of a redirectionality, which is different from simply acting in a certain direction and not changing course completely. <laughs> I mean, I think what it does, it's, it's, metacognition is a way of directing one's attention to the objectification process that is thinking. So, in other words, it's like, um, one way or another, I'm going to make the experiences that I have in the world into objects, into words, labels, other approximations of them, so I can refer to them, so I can attribute to them meaning, so I can glean knowledge from them, or whatever, you know? In that process of making them into objects, we default to making them objects in certain ways. So, it's like when Let's say that somebody says, uh, oh, that can't be a good idea because Joe said it and Joe's an idiot. I would say, I would objectify it by going, by pointing out that it's an ad hominem attack or that it's fallacious or use some other objects like labels like that to render that object into a, to attribute to it a status that that cause it to function differently within the object system. Now, to the extent that I, what I'm doing right now, where I'm saying, um, this is what I tend to do, this is my habit of objectification regarding other objects like, like the one I named, that's metacognition, because it's saying, um, without considering other ways in which I might respond to that kind of a statement, I will default to saying that's a ad hominem attack. And but the thing is, I don't I don't need to metacognate about that sort of stuff usually because it's mostly just um, I've mostly parsed it all out anyway and there's not a lot to be gleaned from that. On the other hand, metacognating about 
my approach to a physical world project, like uh, making this wagon that I made over here. Uh, this was the second attempt at the wagon, and I learned shit from the first attempt, and I tried to use good TE when I made it, and this wagon, the construction of it went a lot more smoothly than the first one. It's a good wagon. And I even did some really smart TV things like this. Fuck yeah! Hell yeah! It's got a handle. Oh. <laughs> it. It's got a handle. On it. right? That's good TE right there. That's really good TE. Because if I want, if, if I want to turn it around and it's kind of a small space, I got a handle right here, right? Eric, right, you want to you want to get some rims? You want to get some rims on the spinners? It's made out of these old drawers. You should get one of those hydraulic things that makes it bounce at the front. And it's made out of these old drawers, so it's like recycling, and it's got its own little walls. See, so it fits it all out. That's good to see, right? <laughs> now, that's what I mean by free will, is saying to myself, Eric, you know how you are. You're a fucking retard. I, I, I do so many retarded things when I'm making shit like that. You know you're a fucking retard. I hereby task oh. you, so. I hereby task you. Be less retarded. Yeah. It's the best laugh I've had in 24 hours. My wagon? <laughs> do, you think it's, do you think it's bad to eat or what? Not, no, not your wagon in and of itself, but your wagon in conjunction with Kestrel's comments. Oh, what did you say, <sighs> Kestrel? I didn't hear you. <laughs> I didn't say anything. It was just like, you know, I like cars. You know. Hey, I wish I was dead. I understand. You really need to use the subjunctive mood there. I wish I were dead. You shouldn't say that to him. He's got an obsession with like he's like planning out his serial killer run. He's Ooh. working that out. Ooh. I wish I was dead. Who is that? Uh, Eskel? Our Portuguese friend? Oh, Stevo. I wish I was. No, you still need to have were. I wish I were a dead bird. I wish I was dead bird. I wish I was a dead bird. Uh, gosh, what's the name of that symbol? I feel like an idiot now. Asterisk quote INFJ. You're not an INFJ, Steve-O. You're an INFP. You're an ENFP, maybe. No, you're an INFP. Really? <clears throat> Why, Eric? <laughs> Your FE is not good enough to be an INFJ. Really? Really. Why is my FI not good enough? No, your FE is not good enough. FE, really? Uh, yeah. Um, okay, Actually, let's get back I to love the topic. It. Anger. Let's get back to the topic of anger. So... This I live think stream I, I have, is about anger, Steve. Really, Are you angry, Steve-O? He's angry. He shuts down when he's angry. He's, he's one of those happy serial killers. Jeremy, how often do you get angry? Like, low-level frustrated angry or like kicking a door off its hinges angry. Well, how often do you speak angrily to people? Oh, that's very rare. Very rare, okay. How often do you express... Very anger? rare. How often do you express anger by breaking something? Three times a year. I love the precision of that answer. Um... On average. How often do you get angry by, uh, let's say, 
clenching your fist or jaw or, or just being not not display not breaking anything but but sort of physically experiencing the anger. A dozen times a week. And usually it's over an extraordinarily petty shit, too. Right. The way that I characterize it is that I have enormous macro patience. So, like, on a 10, 20, 30-year time frame, I have enormous patience. But in micro patience terms, I can lose patience very quickly. But it doesn't necessarily manifest physically. Most of it's just kept inside, nice and neat, tidy. Hmm. Well, see, I have a lot of sideshow Bob experiences, especially now that I'm doing all this like, like husband uh, fixing shit and stuff that I've never done before, really. Not, not in a sustained way. Um, when I say I have a lot of sideshow Bob experiences, I'm referencing one of the episodes in which he he's outside someplace and it's just a yard full of rakes and he steps on a rake and comes and hits him in the face and he goes Ugh. and then he tries to take he takes the next step and another rake hits him in the face and goes Ugh. I had that experience quite a bit I was having almost that exact experience the other day in the garage as I was working on something and as usual when I'm working on something in that capacity, it's hard for me to keep to be smart about my little trays of, of screws and shit like that. So as always, I've got them on the ground, all around my feet. I'm stepping on them, they're spilling. I trip over it again, I step on it again, and I move it over here, but now I moved over there and I step on it again. And it's just like, oh my fucking god! I just want to freak out, you know? And sometimes I do throw shit. Like in the garage, I'll, I'll, I'll be like, okay, this stuff has to move. You go over there, and you go over there, and you go over there. And I get very upset. You know, it never manifests, but I can tell you something that happens <clears throat> probably five or six times a week that triggers my lack of micro patience. I all, not always, but I would say 80, 85% of the time I'll open my wife's car door. Right. And she always drives. So I'll open the door for her and she gets in the car and I'm holding the door open, but she won't move her foot out of the door jam. She's like getting situated, getting like in the seat, <laughs> getting the steering wheel, getting everything ready. But she's leaving her fore and their foot in the door jam. And I'm standing there like an idiot for like 10 seconds. It's insignificant. Right. Doesn't matter. It's 10 seconds. Yeah. I'm, I get frustrated. Move, just move your foot so I can close the door and get in the car and light my cigarette. That that's the petty, nonsensical type of micro impatience that I deal with on a daily basis. <laughs> well, can I ask you why did you open the door for her in the first place? Because I care about her. It's a nice gesture. Okay. Why the fuck don't you? That's my <laughs> question. She's your wife. Uh, well, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's the thing is, I don't really have, I don't get impatient with Kimberly particularly like that in terms of that kind of stuff, although I can see how that would be frustrating. That could be very frustrating. But what I have is impatience, similar things with situations around here. And I've slowly been getting rid of them. I'll give you guys a little tour of some of the nonsense I've been getting dealing with. When I first got here in this house, Kimberly had stepping stones but she hadn't sunk them into the ground at all she just set them on top of the grass <laughs> so they were tripping stones okay right here 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 all along here there's a bunch of tripping stones to trip over you're supposed to obviously sink those things down to ground level they're not supposed to be tripping stones here where, here where the trash cans are <laughs> Here's the there hilarious. used to be a little stump, and it was like one of the trash cans would sit on the stump and it would just be off kilter, and no one ever took the stump out. So 
I took that thump out. That's gone. What are fucking incredible frustrations are there? Well, when I first moved, when I first came here, it was not possible to bring the car back here like this because it's all the stuff. Which means every time you, you had to park the car here, next to this cactus, <laughs> you get out and you go, oh, 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 to try to get out of the car. So now I've cleared up the shit. Like <laughs> <laughs> I've cleared up the shit so you can get back in here. The garage was a disaster when I got here. And it's starting to look pretty good now. I'm starting to put a handle on shit. It's, uh, it's a work in progress. I still got more shit to put together. Like, this is my main tool. Oh, area. So is that, is that before? Oh, I'm, I'm stepping. Because I was here yesterday morning, but I can't resist. So is that before or after she went out there and threw a bunch of shit away that you didn't need? <laughs> <laughs> Did she throw a bunch of shit away that I didn't need? Oh, no, I threw a bunch of shit away that she didn't need. <laughs> Uh, allegedly it's allegedly i did yeah i think it's, she was she was really being periody yesterday that's not she's not normally like that that felt awkward man <laughs> so i was like i don't need to be here i should log out but if i do that he might i don't know um what? oh crap you know what's even worse though than her leaving her foot in the door jam though this this really infuriate infuriates me I'll go to Walmart for one thing, like creamer for the coffee or a cable, one thing. And I'll like get behind a group of people that are there, maybe three people, and they'll be like side by side walking as slow as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really And I'm like, get, get in line, right? And let me get around you or speed it up. What, why are you moving so slowly? It makes no sense whatsoever. You want to be here? Is that you're just loitering? Yeah, that, that kind of petty little stuff sets me off. I, I, I've chipped my teeth gritting them over things like that. So, this is Kimberly's salon here. She had this thing set up kind of weird, but she had this, this chair here is her shampoo chair. This is a new one. We just got this, and she found it. The slab's delivered, okay? It's crazy the way shit happens. But anyway, 40 bucks for this chair. And it's, a, it's a great shampoo chair. But the thing is, this sink was like put in half acid. So it's not passively, I like that. So it was wobbly and shit. And she had and so what she had done is she had put these blocks underneath it to prop it up. And then the chair couldn't slide underneath it like it's supposed to, so she had that half assed to whatever. So the, one of the problems was that this this chair and the other one too are too short now on a platform down here. They're too short. So I tried to, uh, this is an example of TE gone awry. I tried to do this crazy fucking thing. I must have spent six hours on it. I finally got it to do, to do what I wanted to do. But, uh, of course it was not usable. <laughs> it's the fucking crazy stupid idea I ever had. This is NE gone awry. This is not free will. This is Eric being stupid. So, Kimberly said, oh, I need this chair to be a little bit higher. I need to make a platform or something. I'm like, aha, I've got an idea. I've got this lift from a different chair that's broken. I'll take that lift off that different chair, and I'll put this on a lifter thing. And I did. I successfully did put it on the lifter thing. It's right here. I'll show you. Okay, so I put it on this. <laughs> I put it on this. It took me forever. It took me at least six hours to do that. It was a pain in the ass. I, I attached a board to the bottom of the chair. But obviously, there's no way in hell any quite. And look at, I, I put this here to stop it from going back to the bottom. This little block of shit. <laughs> Otherwise, it would just fall all the way back. 
So obviously You've got to give me the number for your dealer. It wasn't safe for anybody to sit in that chair. So I was just like, okay, well, that was a disaster. So like, I'm like, can't really just, I forget it. I can't, just, can you look and see how much it costs to get into one of those chairs? She like looks and pops up available just 20 minutes from here. One of those chairs, the one that's way better than the one she had for 40 bucks. This is a slab. And how much time did you spend? Like six hours on it. So you're talking about like, what, seven, six dollars and fifty cents an hour worth of your time spent that could have been accommodated by. I learned by that a lot. Purchase. I learned a lot doing that. The reason it took so long is because, like, you have to get. First, I just tried to attach it to the. To the, uh... Okay, let me ask you this. This is the MBTI question here. Uh-huh. Is is good and reasonable cost benefit analysis a TI or a TE that's function? A, a, that would be okay. I mean, that'd be TE. My TI yeah. has come up with reasons why that was a good thing, good way to spend my time. <laughs> Does that qualify as sophistry? Uh, no, because I think it's, I think my point is kind of legitimate. I do need to learn about the TE shit. I like doing this stuff, but I don't have good habits. And I learned a lot making that chair. I really did. Now, I currently have visions, though, of somehow putting it on wheels and, and attaching a lawnmower engine to it and riding around on a little elevated throne. So I may, it may, I may not be done with that chair yet. That's the other thing. Now, that sounds really dangerous, but I've got some safety features in mind. Basically, training wheels, you know. So, in like a month, are you going to have a chair with like 400 balloons attached to it? I mean, like, <laughs> maybe. I also built this fence here, this enclosure, as Kimberly kept complaining that she wanted me to make this. But it, it wasn't it wasn't straightforward. For, I had to take out. I the, the hardest part of it is hammering in these holes here. Yeah, the main hole. The the metal thing there goes all the way into the ground. It's hard to get it in there because into the ground because you have to you can't hit the, the metal part itself with a sledgehammer. You have to have a wooden block of some sort in there to hit it with to hit. But you can't hit the block you're using because you'll crack it. So you have to find some other thing to hit or to pound it into the ground. Well, I had to, I pounded into those, put them in, and then had to take them out twice. You know, so why? Because I, I was figuring out as I went, I didn't have a plan. I was like, okay, well, let's pound in one right here. This is like the first thing I did to start. Like, it's stupid. You have, to, you have to know what you're going to do. But, of course, we weren't really sure. We don't do measuring tapes very well. I was like, well, we won't really know how to do it until we start to do it. That's, no, Eric, you're just being stupid. So, what else was going on around here? Well, I mean, th things that I, mean, I had to trip over 50 times before I fixed the problem. This, this gate's an ongoing problem. So, okay, it doesn't close right, so we go like this, and it just doesn't close. You have to push this down first to close it, and you have to make sure it's out of the way, you know, and then you go, okay, right, now it's closed. And you go to the other side, and you want to open it. You have to push, pull, and then it'll open. So it's like, no, this is not okay. I have to solve this problem. But it's one of a list of a million things that have to be done. Well, just take a software engineer approach and say it's a feature. That's how it's supposed to work. <laughs> I don't like that. This thing, he had... When we moved it up from the garage, she put it here. 
right here. So we tripped over it every single time we walked past it. This is Paula T.E. She just is completely oblivious to that. When she cooks, she has no concept of for, of not using very many dishes so she won't have to wash them later. You know, she's just like, she'll use 50 pots and 50 pans and 50 plates to cook one egg. I'm still interested in that uh, Jeremy's microaggressions against his wife. <laughs> And the door issue, it's, car door. It's micro patience, not micro aggression. Well, yeah, right. So, Jeremy, what do you do when when you you open the door because you love your wife and yes. you you know you're a caring husband, and then the bitch just won't get the fucking foot out of the way. So, <laughs> you know what I do? What? I wait. You wait like a passive aggressive kind of way. Like, well, no, there, there doesn't need to be any passive aggression. I just, I'm like, okay, she's been situated. And I recognize that this is silly for me to get all worked up about. And, you know, I'll use my free will, as Eric was saying so eloquently earlier, and I'll resist my default nature that gets impatient about this little piece of nonsense it's not it's not like she leaves the foot in the door jam for 20 minutes you know it's not a significant amount of time it's I, what i'm pointing out is how insignificant amount of time it's necessary for me to get pissy inside where yeah. it start, starts welling up do you say anything no you should tell her you say dude move your foot Look at this. It's not. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I don't want to have to drive to the hospital first. I don't think it's it's not significant enough to warrant making an issue out of. It. I see. And I pick my battles. All right. See this thing. Is it a battle? See this goes up, right? It, so it could become a battle, not even a battle, but it could become a. a <sighs> A vanilla form of offense to make an issue over such a silly little thing. You should just reach down and, and basically move your foot in. yourself. What's that? You should just reach down and move her foot in yourself. You know that might <clears throat> that might have a dual purpose. It could be seen as flirting. Right. I could I I could be solving my impatience issue and scoring some flirtation points at the same time. I might try that. I mean, what what what's wrong with just going and saying, "Honey, move your foot," and then he's a, it's like he's it's not an INTJ, argument. It's not a, that's why, because he's an INTJ. He functions differently. If he if he yeah, I'm trying to understand. He probably I don't know, Jeremy. I would guess that you just think. He'd rather not impose the request upon her. I don't know if I would I would say it that way. Some things are just worth letting slide. Okay. Even if it's even but if it's, it's, it's not it's not it's not it, you know it your conception of what it is and it sliding means the value that you've assigned to it is it's a problem. Whereas in her mind, she's sort of unconsciously got her foot there. What you could say, because obviously nobody wants to be stood waiting all day, you know, while, while somebody becomes conscious of their foot. Um, you could just say, you know, without malice, without prejudice is a legal term, a legal letter might arrive, um, move your foot, honey. And it's not an argument. It's not a problem. I, I, let me share a let me share a vicarious anecdote with you. I'm sure you're familiar with who Carl Sagan is. Yeah, yeah, the Jesuit. <laughs> yeah, uh, I've read two of his biographies, and in one of them, I don't remember which of the two, there was a discussion, or a a they were he was going on about a big fight that took place between Carl Sagan and one of his three wives. And the fight was based on him pointing out to his wife that during the morning routine, if she would like reorder 
when she made his toast and prepared his coffee and and you know that whole bit if she did it in this uh, this order that he thought was optimized that it would save 20 like 20 seconds a day and that that added up to and, you know whatnot now the the biographer who who wrote this biography said and i love the way he put this he goes carl had a point a stupid point but a point nonetheless did it warrant an argument and a fight with with his wife perhaps not it, it on a technical quantitative level Yes, he had a point, that's, but that's, was it worth? That's such a great anecdote. It's so perfect, Jeremy. It, it explains it. It explains your perspective on it perfectly. I would, I would add, uh, Kessler and Jeremy as well, of course. But I would add that with poor Effie, Jeremy probably doesn't want to make the Effie calculus of whether a given thing is going to fall into category A or B. Oh. Uh. Some shit's just not worth it. Um, okay, I want to show you guys this mirror and this thing here. As an example of polar TE and the kind of shit I've been dealing with in general right here. So, this now goes up and down. The reason it goes up and down is because it used to open like this. This way. But Kimberly, from the time I got here, until I changed it, banged her head on it three separate times. She'd have it open, she'd bend down, she'd come up and bang her head on it. And ah, I come in and outside and go, ah, it hurts a lot. When I changed this, I explained to her, look, Kimberly, I've, I've made it so you won't ever bang your head on it again. And um, she was kind of like, didn't, didn't really care or get that I had done something useful here because she doesn't understand the hows of things very well. So she doesn't, she doesn't see her banging her head on that as a problem of the situation of the room. She sees it as a problem of her SI. I forgot that, that I, I forgot again and went up. I got to learn to stop doing that. That's the difference between SIFE and SITE. ISTJ, that would never persist for a second. I had this light bulb was out for a long ass time. Finally, I changed it because it's such a long list of things that, you know, and we had to move all the shit out of all the different places. There's this, there was this situation on lots of, lots of rooms right here where the doors do this. How annoying is that? But I took off the closet door in the room because it, it, the closet door in the main bedroom, it was, I was, it was, to walk into the room, it was like you had to reach around the door, close the inside door, then it was a nightmare. Kimberly also has a long habit of putting rugs where they conflict with doors. I've had to, I've had to, I think I've gotten rid of most of them. Like, she wants a rug right here. She'll try to put a rug right here, but there's no room for the door to go over a rug. And so every time you open the door, you hit the rug. And she would just leave it like that. And that's, that's polar to eat. Okay? She would just not understand why. And the fact that she gets frustrated every time she does this links to the physical space and the physical objects and how they're arranged and stuff. I'm trying to trying to uh, uh, compile that understanding about Jeremy the way that Jeremy works there, um, because uh, I forget that um, because they're so um, affable and what have you, uh, I forget that INTJs don't have FE and. Um, and I, I couldn't because to me, you know, if I was in that situation, I would just say, "Honey, move your leg and what have you." But being an introvert, 
being a feeling introvert, it just stays on the inside and it's not a problem. But to me, if I had to do that every day and she did the same thing every day and left it there, if I, if I didn't say anything, it <laughs> would bubble up. It would get really on my tits, you know. But I'd, I'd have said something by that point, do you know what I mean? So we both deal with it in our own way. I get Jeremy's position on it too in the sense that there's when I'm doing something to be nice to Kim, when I'm going <coughs> taking action to be a good boyfriend, then obviously I'm in I'm in a state of mind where I'm gonna be totally patient anyway because I'm trying to in that moment be selfless for her. So it doesn't make any sense then for me to be like impatient about her receiving of my selflessness. Yeah, well, that's what I thought. But but it the way that what Jeremy uh, was saying there was he was actually pissed off with that, but yeah. it, it, he let it slide. Whereas I couldn't. I, I would just you know I couldn't be in that state. But what got me curious was that. Uh, You'd said, Jeremy, that you had sort of long-term patience, but kind of short-term yeah. impatience. I was like, how? Because I couldn't have the long-term patience if the short-term things weren't in, weren't like sorted out. But you know, you've got FI, so you know you can put things in order for yourself. Yeah, they're, I mean, they're, they're totally different paradigms almost. There's. <clears throat> When I say long-term patience, that I'm gonna I'm gonna use incredibly sloppy language here. That that's a bit hyperbolic. That's that overstates what I'm getting at, but is very easy and is in alignment with the quantity of alcohol that I've had this evening. <laughs> there are people that have wronged me back in the '90s. And I'm very patiently waiting for the moment to, uh, oh, how do I put this without looking, <laughs> without looking sinister? Restore <laughs> equilibrium to the spheres. There you go. Restore equilibrium. That, that's it. That I'm not sitting here twiddling my thumbs and grinding my teeth waiting for the moment I'm just it'll come that was yeah. such a, a trailer moment by the way when you said that there were people who have wronged me <laughs> back in the 90s <laughs> hence, hence the, the the disclaimer before I even made the statement that it was going to be hyperbolic it's not like I have knives and tools and pliers and blow torches on the ready <laughs> you know it. That's crazy. No, I mean it's not crazy. Crazy. I mean that hey. to me to do that. I can see how you're not crazy. I can't. But you know what? I, I, like, with it. I like this the screenplay idea here. I think the scene begins with the love interest lady. We'll call her Judy. Okay. Judy's Judy's frustrated. She's frustrated. Jimmy. She says, Jimmy, "She's getting the car." Jimmy, what is it? Every time I talk about the 1990s, you freak out. <laughs> and he says. <laughs> People, uh, wrong you know, me. The, people wrong me. People wrong back in the night. These are situations where these these, in, these individuals <laughs> would probably, if, car speaking, if they met me, if they met me, you know, at the mall or something. I don't go to the mall, but if they met me, they'd be, be like, "Do you remember me?" And I'd be like, "Oh yeah, yeah, I I, I totally fucking remember every detail, every word. Just wait." Wow. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's a good observation, Castro, you made about FI linking FI to long term patients. Because FI is ultimately the appreciation of how relationships with people in particular, but also with situations or objects or whatever, or aspirations develop over time and become like because I'm FI polar, I didn't really understand that the reason it doesn't make any sense to try to get somebody to commit all in forever to you right away is because you won't know really how a relationship is 
until they spend some time in it because it's mostly a relationship is a developmental arc over time. That finds weird. I don't. But yeah, so it will make you patient, especially with relationships, because you're thinking that the experience of the relationship becomes ever richer the longer you're in it. So just sitting there doing nothing but being in the relationship deepens it. You know, the, the dynamic of the relationship in and of itself makes that kind of a difficult example. A better example would be, like I, was, I said a second ago, is my aspirations. <clears throat> if you went back to when I was 15 and told me that I would be almost 40 before I got to the point where I am now, I'd be like, oh, I'm going to kill myself. It's going to take that long. But as I've gotten older, I've not really worried so much about it. And now my attitude is like, okay, it's time. I, you know, I've, I've waited and I've developed and now it's, it's the appropriate time. Um, and it's a lot of things in my life are like that now. It's, you know, 10 years to do something. Okay. I got 10 years. I got 40 years. So that's the, the impetuousness of youth. Um, that I see in a lot of people my age that they haven't shed um, is something that I don't struggle with. So it took 20 years, 25, 30 years. Okay, that's that's how long it takes. And that hasn't been a problem for me. It's those, those in the moment things that I can ramp up really quickly and get impatient and frustrated and angry about. I don't get angry about long-term stuff, just short-term stuff. Like in in the immediate moment, short term. All right, let's check the chat. What we got here. Do not impede doorway. Make a sign that says "Do not impede doorway." Says Jeremy. Jeremy. Oh yeah, that that kind of stuff. And what's funny is, this is also, and this is. When, I, when I'm walking, like when we go to a restaurant or we go out and get something, I walk really fast, like crazy fast. And everybody else, no matter who am I with, my wife or my mom or whoever it is, they walk like half my speed. So I have to, from my perspective, like walk in slow motion or stroll or meander to hang back with people. And that's frustrating too. Well, I used to get very frustrated by having to wait for other people to finish eating. So my ex-wife Candace used to get extremely frustrated with me um, because I'd be like, uh, okay, Candace, I'm done. Let's go. Right, we get to the restaurant, we serve food, and... I go, ha! All right, I'm done. Are you going to be much longer? You're eating a long, you sure are taking a long time to eat this. Yeah, so, uh, she'd get very annoyed with things like that. I don't blame her. It's, it's silly that I was in a hurry. I, I, I used to always be in a hurry. Now, with Kimberly, it's weird. I A lot of times, if we're in a good mood, I'm not, we're not upset or something. I can just sit there with her and just just sit next to her. It's fine. It's good enough. I'm fully entertained. It's weird. I'm, ha I'm looking yeah, forward to going off of, on to Sleepy Week, as, as I always am, because I, I, it makes me feel closer to Kimberly. It's my last day on uh, Cycle. Go ahead, Jeremy. You know, conversely, if I go out to eat, let's say it's me and my wife and a third person. And that third person and I get into a conversation. I'll be like talking and not eating. And my wife will be done eating and she's like, it's time to go. And, and it's almost like that's her version of my lack of micro patients that, you know, she's done and, and it's time to go and they're going to close soon. And I'm sitting there like, we're like 10% the way into a really decent conversation here. And you're worried about leaving. 
Right. It, it goes both ways. Everybody has their thing. Yeah. I don't really get too impatient with Kimberly except in her communication. That's where I get impatient with. When she's not communicating fairly, according to my understanding of it, then I get frustrated. But that's where I'm not going to get frustrated anymore. I, I made the determination. I said, I put a little sign up in the bathroom after the last time I yelled at her. I said, Kimberly, Eric hereby resolves. Number one, I'm no more raising my voice at you or yelling at you. And number two, less hyperbolic or harsh language about your family, even the horrible one. Um, and I indicated that she should cite these as one and two if I if I fail to uphold that, which should shut that down immediately, right? Because so basically I'm saying, here it is in writing, I'm not going to yell at you anymore. If I do start to yell at you, remind me of this, and that will shut it down. It's like a contract. It's It's a way of cornering myself. So I can't, it's cutting off certain argumentation chains for myself. In other words, I can't make any arguments now about why it's okay for me to yell at you in this circumstance. Now, this is different because it was unequivocal in what I said I was going to do, and I told you to cite it if I do yell at you because I don't need that tool. That's the thing. Has that come up yet? Well, no, because I haven't, I haven't yelled at her since I said that. I wrote that down. But it was just, I mean, there will come a time when I get angry, I'm sure. And then it's going to be, that's when, that's when I'm going to grow as a human being. It's going to be like, okay, Eric, you're going to have to use a little TE style goal orientation here rather than TI style justice orientation. And yeah. it, I'm not, I'm not talking smack about the justice orientation. But for me, my growth area is to maximize my TE, my ability to include TE framing and shit. And that's what being with my dual has empowered me to do because her TE is even worse than mine. So I'm able to help her with that. She allows me to, you know, I put her, her shampoo chair on top of that thing. <laughs> Most, that's the thing, is like, I need to be able to do that shit and still be, still get credit and respect for the fact that I've done so many other things successfully around here. Being an ETP means I'm going to have disastrous failures like that, or like the first wagon, which on its maiden voyage, I overloaded with various things in a broken half. I spent a lot of time on the first wagon. But one of the things I have learned being with Kimberly is that persistence does pay off that if I keep at it I'll figure out what I'm doing stupid I'll figure out a way around it and it'll come together I kept those parts of that wagon I said I'm gonna make this wagon again it will be reborn and in fact it was and it felt very satisfying yesterday when I finished it and I was like damn straight because it's a good wagon now works well and it's much more intelligently designed, less designed for, the first wagon has like multiple stories. I had like five different floors stacked up in different ways. It was too wide, it was too long. It, it was just, a, it was an N-E wagon rather than a N-E-T-E wagon. This one is still has a little N-E, still a little fun because it's got drawers. But the rest, of, in every other aspect, is as te as I can make it. It's, it's structurally sound. It's I use the right kinds of right pieces of wood for the right parts and blah blah blah. blah. And I, this straight is, up pussy wagon. Kimberly gives me permission to fail like that and still succeed without being rendered bad at that shit. Candace was always subjecting me to ontological violence in that regard. I was not considered competent enough. To be left unsupervised to do shit. I, I like a child. Yeah, I kind of don't blame her because I do shit like take Kimberly's uh, salon shampoo chair and stick it on top of a rising thing from another chair. It doesn't work with that, and all that kind of crazy shit is stuff that I do do. But if you give me, if you give me enough credit and time to work through my process. 
then two things come into play. Number one, I will successfully get some shit done, and you'll see that it's not, it, it's a mixed bag at first. And number two, I have this ability to improve at things in general because I, as a life habit, have worked at getting better at things, whatever it is. So I'm good at that. I'm good at getting better at stuff. And so I am getting better at TV. I am getting better at using tools and being smart and not being stupid. And not walking. Well, you, have to. you can't start walking down a path with physical tools and shit and then go, oh, never mind. I'm going to do it. Let me start and go back to the other path now, which is how I normally fucking figure out how to do shit. I, oh, I'll just try this. Wait, no, that doesn't work. No, I'll try this. Oh, that doesn't work. You can't do that when you're building something. You have to think it out ahead of time. Well, I have to admit, the first thing I thought when I saw that chair was, A, what's the likelihood of that single pole right in the middle breaking through the seat of the chair, and B, what's the aftermath of that going to be like if that happens? Well, the chances of that happening are zero because there's a supporting metal structure piece that holds that pole in place. The pole itself is not attached to anything. It's attached to that metal supporting piece. And the metal sporting piece is attached to a board, which in turn is attached to the bottom of the chair. That's good, because that would that would be really hard to explain away you mean, if there were an incident. I'm so sorry <laughs> your mother was impaled today. Um, but good news, Vlad she's Strauss. fine. But we're having a little trouble getting her off of the pole. It's gone deep up in there in her rectum, and she seems happy. She seems to be enjoying it, but uh, maybe that's why we can't get her off the pole. That's an FI. Leave me here. Leave me right here. I'm fine. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, that's that's the great thing about duality, and it helps me deal with my anger some, too, which is I get frustrated when I'm not doing shit successfully, but the fact is um, yeah, I'm given the space to try it again and get it done right, and then I can feel a sense of satisfaction. And I also feel a sense of like, see, I've been trying to say this to everybody the whole time, which is like, will you guys just give me a chance? Oh, I can make that thing too. I can do that kind of whatever. I can blah. Stop dismissing me and reducing me to somebody who can't do shit like that. Although I don't blame you really for doing it. My friend Corey used to talk about solutions by Eric. Solutions by Eric involved usually some like, oh, well, I want to attach this thing to over there, so I'm going to jury rig these like screws in the wall plus a bunch of duct tape plus a bunch of like string, and there is sort of what I want. But I've gotten better and better and better over the years. I'm less like that, and I'm more about trying to do things well when I can step back and remember to focus on that. Anybody else want to comment on anger here? Uh, I'm thinking about probably bringing this live stream to a close. It's been an excellent conversation with everybody. I've had a fun time with it, but I'd like anybody else who wishes to chime in on anger to do so. Neptune, are you an angry, angry motherfucker? And how? Uh, it's probably like the most unfamiliar emotion. It's usually just like frustration that turns into extreme or yeah, it's. I'm more frustrated ever than angry ever. Okay, so like that's always you, how it is. Do you sometimes transition your frustration into meow or even extreme meow? No, it turned into like so frustrated that I get really sad and like want to cry. <laughs> like yeah. Anybody else want to talk about being angry? What makes you angry, Neptune? Uh, bad art. Yeah, that's a harder question. I don't know. Bad art. Does bad art make you angry? Uh, yeah, especially if someone's getting a ton of praise for it. So, like the paint, the the painting where it's just a blank white canvas, does that make you homicidal? No, it probably would just make me confused. <laughs> <laughs> A single brush stroke of red. 
You have a big white canvas, canvas, and then the painter goes takes a brush, dips it in some color paint. I got I got one for you, Neptune. If art is your thing, somebody told me once about an exhibit. I thought it was very clever, but the what they said was the name of it was Line L I N E, and there was a hole in the ceiling, and ink poured through the hole and made a, a steady stream to the floor where there was a small opening and received it. So it was basically this line in the air from the ceiling to the floor as art. Would that piss you off? No, I mean, I appreciate like innovation and people doing something new, but if I see something that's been done before or is completely contrived or only doing something for the sake of like, I don't know. I mean, that sounds shock really value. Funny, Jeremy, I think that sounds like a cool idea. I thought it was as well. I'll give you another example of that that I heard of one time. And it was, I heard somebody in my friend Dave's art class did this, and Dave told me about it. They made a drawing whereby they used the movement of the sun and a magnifying glass to draw curves and, and, so that's cool. and burn and did it like that. I think for me, I, I can't help but recognize when there's a lack of craft involved. Now, having a high concept like the line or using the magnifying glass and the sun to burn lines, that's high concept, but that's not refined craft. That's not 20 years of working your art and, and developing your skills and reaching the point where you can produce something that's on a technical level outside of most people's capacity. And I, I there, the there, thing that it kind of... There are two competing well, realities here, too, which is, from, from my perspective, well, it, take music, for example, or being a chef. So if I go to... Uh, a local burger place, not a chain, where they actually you know make their burgers according to their approach here. Look, some local burger place, and they make me a spectacularly good burger and, and fries, and sit down and eat it. That meal might be better than a meal from, from my perspective or in my experience of it than uh, the, a meal made by a much uh, fancier chef at a fancier restaurant. I might enjoy the the meal I have at the local burger place more. I might find it tastier. I might conclude that the, for all intents and purposes, the person who made me this meal is a better chef. Or I might simply conclude that in this particular one instance, this guy had it all. It all came together and he killed it, and it's a perfect burger. Now with music, it's very it's similar in the sense that I could write 50 songs. And one of them could be great. And it could be one that I come up with at the beginning. And it could be, I don't have to learn, I don't have to know how to play an instrument very well to write a really great song. But I'm much more likely to write a really great song if I'm somebody who has attempted that many, many times because I start to, whatever whatever my natural ability level is in terms of songwriting, whatever sort of natural gems I have within me are more likely to come out correctly and more likely to be discovered if I'm practiced in trying to find them and discover them. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's true because... You know, like bands, they don't do the best work towards the end, do they? Not usually. No, it's always the worst. Well, that's true. They start off with the inspiration and, you know, the new interesting thing that they've got to bring to the table. And then and then it's all about, you know, trying to recapture that quite a lot of the time or they don't seem to be able to, or they'll go into some other area where they're not really as strong, you know. 
I mean, so, yeah, the goal for for well, bands with longevity, it seems to be like the the one third mark. You know, the, if you're looking at a Rush or a Pink Floyd or somebody like that, it's like a third of the way in is when they they hit it. But I mean, it seems. the point is that there's a craft yeah. of songwriting, but there's also a reality that a song is an entity in and of itself, and its quality is inherent to itself and it, the better the song the less it is attached to the songwriter so even somebody who has very little skill if they have if, a, if they happen upon or comes out of them or they in I themselves or whatever a spectacularly good song it could be way better than a song that is by written by somebody who is 50 years in the songwriting business it could be the song that everybody remembers, like, you know, Come On Eileen. It's not like those Dexys Midnight Runners wrote a bunch of great songs, but there's no reason to conclude that some Beatles song is better than Come On Eileen because the songs themselves, the singles, exist as their own entities with their own defined natures that are described by melodic identities and rhythmic identities. Yeah, but, you know, in fairness to Dexys Midnight Runners, I do think they actually had a lot of really great songs. Oh, did they? I don't know their music. I'm sorry. I, 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 they may have, I have, I'm not saying they didn't. I don't know any of their music except for that song. I was sort of assuming they were one-hit wonder. But, uh, I know they, they weren't together have. for that long, but I don't think. But, they, you know, they, they definitely had uh, a lot of songs. <laughs> sorry, go on, Jeremy. You know, it's, it's kind of ironic when we talk, because, first of all, we're talking about songs. I mean, within music, you've got a, a, a huge spectrum to draw upon. Songs, symphonies, operas, concertos, scores. You've got the, it's a very broad uh, paradigm. But within the scope of songs, I've, I found it interesting that even a band like Journey, their best music is never their, was never their singing. There were some really interesting cool songs that were buried in their albums that people that just heard listen to the radio never heard yeah and if you're gauging the quality of a song on mass consensus then the one hit wonderdom is of course valid but as somebody who is part of that craft and i'm listening to other people's work a lot of journey singles are trite and rehashed and just not very interesting but then you get into their albums and stuff like that and their songs they're like holy shit that's actually a really cool song but it would never appeal to, to me to the mass consensus to me songwriting quality can be determined in a pretty simple way which is strip down the song to the most basic form of comping with the melody and if it is satisfying persistently over time to play, if it resonates consistent, persistently over time when you do get that in its most stripped down version, then it's a good song. In order to, having a good track is a very different question than a good song. A good song is a good song played badly, a good song played well, a good song done by this guy who doesn't have very good pitch. It's, it's, ah, he's fucking up that good song. The good song is something that shines through any given um, rendition of it. I don't, I'm not sure that's that's a, a reasonable uh, definition because um, I, I think that you might be looking at song music as something too static. If you Take, you know, a hundred hundred years from now, you know, culture is going to be different. People are going to be different. So they're not going to take an Elton John song and go, oh, that's good. You know, White Christmas. It might, they might be completely irrelevant. White Christmas. White Christmas is a good song. It's, it's a I got one for you, Eric. Think about this before you answer this. Which is the better song? Stairway to Heaven or Dust in the Wind? It takes a moment, but just ponder that for a second. There's no right answer. 
It's just a good thought. No, there it's is a, a good right thing answer. to consider. No, Jeremy, there definitely not is a right so. answer. I'm not sure which it is right now, but there is definitely a right answer. We have to reject aesthetic relativism. There is you have to a, qualify your answer. better answer. Depend on your qualifications. Well, like I said, they're both I, if excellent I, if I songs. I played both of them on the guitar, and um, and again, you you made the distinction correctly, wisely uh, between different kinds of songs. What I'm talking about a song is a little different than a composition. It seems to me, "Stairway to Heaven" is more like a composition than a song. True, it's more ambitious. Um, so. It's also more dynamic. Dust in the wind. Well, a song, I mean, then, okay, make a definition. I mean, a, a song can just be a melody, can't it? You know, you sing humming a little song. You know? Right. So it is. Well, that is exactly what it is. For example. Um, well, a song is a form. You know, a symphony is a form. An opera is a form. Songs, by definition, that's a specific form. But it's, but, he, but, but no, it's a, it's a specific melodic identity which is comprised both of pitch and rhythm, and it has a specific um, procession of sections that... That's true, that's true, but let me ask you this. Does a song have movements? Does it have movements? Yeah. I didn't know what a movement is. No. You see, that, that's that making my point by asking the question. Song form does not involve movements so the definite and dude i mean i'm being kind of a snob here because it's my craft but songs fall into a certain structural category and both of those are songs and of the two stairway to heaven is the more ambitious but you know uh don giovanni is not a song it doesn't fit that structural definition. Okay. And all right, fine. So, so, so what I we're just talking about songs. Yeah, I'm talking about songs specifically, and I'm talking about things that tend to run in the two to three minute long range, or sometimes longer, depending on how indulgent the songwriter is. I think of a song That's as true. something that has a specific melodic and maybe lyrical message to get across, and that is comprised of verse, chorus, and probably a bridge. And it probably yeah, okay, yes, yeah. so that's the, and it, exactly. It doesn't have movements. It's got verse, chorus, and it, bridge, and it maybe. Probably goes verse, chorus, verse, bridge, verse, chorus, or something like that. You know, some common. It could be yeah, verse, verse, chorus, like verse, that. chorus, bridge, chorus. Yeah, but but the point ABA, is, ABA. the point is that exactly. Yeah, that if you take a song like that, what we what we understand about music, first of all, is that it is the least time sensitive of all the media forms. We can't re-watch a video 50 times, but we can re-listen to a song 50 times. We can't hear a joke 50 times and still find it funny, but we can listen to a song 50 times and still, um, and still have it resonate with us. Even more, we become... We, music is timeless in that fashion because it is the art of frequency, the art of time, basically. It, unlike other objective formats, unlike objective formats like... Um, language music is not objective it's fully experiential insofar as you cannot know it without duration and it's not an object it's not an object it's 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 an it's an entity that one interacts with and and that's why music is different than a lot of other art forms but there are objective representations of music such as sheet music and um and like you know, uh, words like movements and, and verse, chorus, whatever. But those are representations of something that fundamentally is itself not an object. A song, however, is an object insofar as it's an entity. That is to say, it's clearly defined and it doesn't change. Like, for example, White Christmas is clearly White Christmas and it is clearly not Silent Night. And White Christmas, if I sung by me or anybody else, is recognizable as the same thing. If I sing it wrong, everybody will agree that I've sung it wrong. If I go, I'm dreaming of a White Christmas, well, okay. and you realize that's let me, not let me right. Because you, you like to think about these kinds of concepts. So you, you said that a song is an object. But for a song to become, it requires the passage of time. 
whereas this lighter does not require that. Correct. It, well, in, a song, that's why I call a song an entity. A song is an entity. Because but not traditionally an object like we would think of an object, something objective. It still requires the experience of it over time. It's not something it's a time object out there. It's a time object, yeah. which means it needs to be to, to ex here. Let me let me read about time objects in this thing real quick. It'll be, it's rel totally relevant. Because a film is the same way. It requires the experience over a duration of time for it to become part of your experience. Yes, but one of the differences is you can read a screenplay and when you're reading text you can the duration of reading text is uh, is But that's that, that's not the movie though. I know it's not, but let me let me get my point across here, which is movies are basically narrative in their identity. That is to say, if you were to describe something about a movie to make it uh, recognizable to somebody else, you're going to end up describing its plot, what happens. You're not going to end up describing necessarily other aspects that are less easy to describe. For example, it's hard to say, to spend a lot of time talking about the soundtrack of something, even if it's hugely important to people's experience of it, it, um, it doesn't it, it's hard. It's harder to talk about. It's like if I were to say, "Do it, do it, a da dance about architecture." Now you'd go dance about architecture. What do you mean? It's hard to, to imagine how one would dance about architecture. So um, let's talk about these objects here. Okay. Well, right. take a painting. Okay, a painting is an object. It's a physical thing. It's out there, but. To use an analogy, reading a screenplay versus watching the movie is like hearing a critic describe a painting versus you seeing it. The painting is, as far as its meaning, its its value, your experience of it. And, he, and reading a description or reading a screenplay isn't conveying the facial expressions of an actor or the motion of a camera or, you know, all of these nuances that contribute to the sum of the parts. Right. That, that's all lacking when you're reading a screenplay or reading sheet music. Okay. But the but performance here's, here's dynamics the are not present. If I am reading a screenplay, let's say I am a speed reader and I can take in a whole page of text at once and know what it all says. Um, I can read through a screenplay and get the entire plot of the movie successfully in a different duration than um, and, and almost in a non-ordinal fashion, in a non-linear fashion. I don't have to read one word, then the next word, then the next word, then the next word. It doesn't work that way for sheet music. It doesn't make any sense to say you understand the meaning of the song without actually going through each note in succession. You can't, you can't encapsulate a progression of notes as a melody into a into an understanding in the way you can with language. But I think it would be easier to, like, at least if you're familiar with sight reading, I think it would be, it, it's for me to read sheet music and to reproduce them, what it represents in my head, that I think would come closer to hitting the mark than reading a screenplay, which lacks the, the performance dynamics of the actors and the cinematographer, and right. the art direction, you. all of that. I agree with you, because the identity of the song is more wholly its melodic and rhythm nature than is the identity of, of a movie more wholly its narrative nature. So you're right, sure. but the thing is, in exchange for that sort of accuracy of representation, what you exchange is the duration thing. You have to, even if you can speak at the tempo or start on the tempo, you have to go through the notes of a song sequentially or else it ceases to be that song whereas the whereas a narrative is much more workwithable in terms of um, linear linearity i can describe to you the the plot while skipping different things and moving things around and have it be basically the same plot idea uh, i can describe to you the, the plot of back to the future and you're probably able to um, 
identify the movie, even if I don't name any of the characters, and my plot description will not include all of the notes of the movie. It won't include them necessarily in the same order, but you'll still be able to get the gist of it because narrative just out like that. And you know, with Back to the Future, that's an interesting example because, like, every almost every aspect of that movie was on point. And I can anybody that's seen the movie even once, I can go da da da, and they know exactly what. Da, 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 yeah, they know exactly what I'm talking about. The the entire all of that I can in three notes, three fucking notes. That's great. I can iterate to another person the the his mom leaning over to him in the car and hitting on him and him frustrated with his dad all, all of the shit that that is encapsulated in that film can can be triggered by three everybody knows those three notes uh, but you see what you, you know, know what's they're, weird is if you had sung those three notes i would have immediately been like oh yeah that's a movie score what i i cannot remember the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark? I would have said something like that. E.T.? or you know, I don't think I would have... I, when well, Raiders in the Lost Ark, I could do four notes. Dun, 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 and you know what I'm talking about. There's something about film that takes what is in music like another level where there's... The, the sum vastly exceeds all of the little pieces. I, I agree and with you the, completely. But uh, can yeah, I, let, that, let me take a minute to to read this thing I've been trying to read here for a bit because it says it's a, it explains it goes over a lot of the shit and it's numbered and it's organized so we have a little bit more directly content here to talk about okay and then I'll let you I'm sorry to interrupt you but non physical yeah. objects are those that operate in their own time space such as a story or song or word are called time objects to highlight their equivalency in terms of stasis objectiveness regardless. Regardless of the presence or absence of corporeal form. A. A time object has distinction, like an object in space, but it's comprised of meaning rather than matter. B. Space objects are defined by such measures as length, height, weight, color, etc. Space, C. Space objects are subject to unidirectional time, a.k.a. causality. D. Time objects are defined by such measures as duration, melody, definition, title, author, definition, etc. E, time objects are not subject to unidirectional time causality, but instead are subject to conditionality. So, in other words, I can rewind the song and play it forward again without anything doing anything other than willing to be so. And uh, so, socionics and Jung refer to introvert functions as objective and extrovert functions as objective. This is simply wrong and, sur and survives no scrutiny. The distinction implicit regarding the physicality of the objects cognated about is meaningless. Expert feeling and expert thinking are not limited to attention to physical objects. Yes, they use data from the outside world and concern themselves with impacts in the world, but so do introverted feeling and introverted thinking. All four judgment functions occur within and are manifestations of the subject. What else could any aspect of an individual's cognition possibly be, but wholly comprised of and entirely contained within the self? So how can anything be objective? Only ob subjects observe. That which does not observe is an object. To observe, the infinitive's meanings, subtextual implications, spelling, pronunciation, rhymes, common usages, and other communicable attributes of the object comprise the verb's identity. Meaningful usage of the verb instantiates an observation because it requires that some thing, an object of some sort, be there to get observed. Thus, when we talk about the objective, we refer to a rhetorical conceit. We refer to the practice of removing from consideration all distinctions unique to any given subject. In other words, subjective considerations like mood, character of the speaker, or previous position stated by the same speaker. The practice of removing personal considerations from the evaluation of claims in dispute provides the distinction between the objective and the subjective, as the terms are used in common parlance. The suffix "-iv", means things that are within the definitional scope of the root. Thus, objective means things within the definitional scope of objects. The definitional scope is constrained only by eliminating that which is a subject. And given that we make the distinction between subjects and objects by checking for the capacity to observe, to be objective is to deem that which observes irrelevant. Um, okay, so now I'm going to find the last thing I want to read about time objects, which is coming right here. So, time objects. Time objects are loops an agent makes like this video, or this document that I'm reading from, or a song. Until digital media, time objects were imprinted upon space objects, paper mostly, sheet music and stuff like that. 
a sculpture is an example of a space object shaped into a time object. In other words, it is a time object, but it only exists as its physical object as well concurrently. Only rendered time objects can be activated, which is to say you need to... A, a time object doesn't exist except insofar as it is activated by another agent who can experience it. A loop is a rendering of an experience. That's and, the key word, experience. Yeah, a loop, then a time object, a loop, is a rendering of an experience or a personal ontological thing into a medium, an object in a medium, either a song or a story or whatever. All time objects have duration. This is important because space objects don't. For still images, it's the duration of attention one puts into the image. One can get the gist of an image in a glance, but to observe all the details, one must spend time looking at the image. An unrecorded conversation is not a time object per se, but each of the participants maintains in his or her head time objects relating to the conversation they each experienced. We know that the sculpture I talked about exists independently of the marble it is uh, carved out of, because if I show you a picture of the sculpture, we'll agree that that's what the sculpture is. is a, you know, if I show you a picture of Venus de, de Milo, we'll both agree that's the name of that sculpture. Um, the utility of a given human experience towards the evolution of the species, metacognitively, supervenes, which means is contingent upon, the activation of time objects generated from the experience of, by the other, generated from that experience by the other. In other words, the reason humanity continues to evolve, even though genetically we don't, is because of this capacity to share experience with one another via the ability to create time objects that can be accessed or activated by others who are willing to devote the amount of attention equal to the duration of the time object in order to learn from or share in the experience of another independent agent with, whose ontological manifestations one has no access to except via this means. Okay, so that's that's all I wanted to read from that. Yeah, uh, the key uh, is the word experience because you know what what distinguishes a painting from just paint on a canvas and. You know, the observer is 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 a key. Uh, you know, with with imagery, it's it's interesting. I've had to deal with this myself because when I was in high school, there was a, a period where I was fond of a particular artist. I won't name the name. And when I would ask people if they were familiar with this artist, they would say to me things that were visual not it did not have to do with the music it has to it had to do with this artist's appearance and to me that was superficial so that's irrelevant that that has no bearing on what i'm talking about i'm talking about the music here and it took a long time for me to finally just yield to the fact that people if, if it's something that doesn't require a commitment of time and the experience associated with time, um, they're much more apt to absorb and incorporate whatever it is into their uh, concepts than something that does require time. You know, if I write a 20-minute song and somebody bails after three minutes, they haven't really got but with a painting, it might take a, you know two or three seconds, and there might be more that is fleshed out through you know you know successive viewings and so forth. But capturing it does, does not seem to depend so heavily on time with something static and visual as it does with something like music that you have to listen to the song. You know, and, and I hate recommending songs to people because half the time I have I feel like I have to qualify. It gets really good halfway through. Why why is that necessary? Why should I even have to be making that comment? People have different are different sort of consumption moods. 
And depending on my mood, I, I either want to report something, I either want to interact with the media patiently and sort of like in a receptive, open fashion, or I want it to, you know, to drive me along in terms of, I want to be actively attentive to it in a way that I want it to keep me jumping. So, like, in my mind, I tend to be the latter kind more. So I like songs that do and do stuff to appeal to me early and often and don't last very long so that they like, keep my ear interested the whole time. But that, yeah, that's, yeah. that's choosing not to engage on something compositionally over the course of a longer stretch of time where you might reflect on, oh, it's neat how this thing here alludes to an earlier variation on that same theme back there, you know? I'm not going to engage with things on that level, but if I'm in a certain mood, I might. Yeah, like, yeah, like I mean, look at Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Everybody knows Ode to Joy, but that that's way very deep into the work. And there's a lot of movies that are incredible, not because of what's happening in the first 20 or 30 or 40 minutes, but what's happening in like the last 10 or 15 minutes of a two-hour movie. And that's a challenge. And that really is a challenge. Uh, did I ever send you those things? Did you get those things from me that I sent you? Yeah, yeah but, but right, right, right now, now I'm like, like preparing, preparing for this movie premiere and no hurry. And and clip clip so much. That's fine. <laughs> Take your time. Listen, I, I, I know I, how I, projects I, work in general when you're doing hobby projects like this. You can sit there for six months and you get to it in six months is fine. I'm not. I have no expectations. But uh, you know, if you if you Listen to the. Uh, you know what else I'm gonna do? Let me do this. I'll put another version. I'm gonna, I'm gonna play a watch all version of the song that I sent to Jeremy, and we'll talk about it a little bit after we watch it. It's a few minutes long, and I'll talk about my struggles with it as a song, and uh, it kind of segue from what we're just saying right there. I think it's a good idea. So uh, ask your indulgence. Yeah. 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 Got this song. By, by the way. Next, Next week, I'm expecting, expecting to be free, free enough to be able, able to look into stuff, stuff like that and other things that have been delayed on account of this project. Uh, what's, today's Thursday now? Yeah. 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 So, so tomorrow, tomorrow night is the premiere of the movie. And then the weekend is the festival, and then Monday is the eclipse. So Tuesday is when all of the shit that I've been working towards for the past three or four, you know, whatever months it's been have passed. And I'll be free again. Nice. Well, it wouldn't be good to have uh, somebody who has SE or SI as a dominant function uh, listening with, because uh, with any and NI, I think the kind of music that they would instinctively enjoy would be very different from a SE, SI kind of music. I disagree. I think everybody basically enjoys the same. This basically enjoys or doesn't enjoy it according to the same fundamental quality of quality of goodness of resonance with its actual true form. Like you know, if if a if a songwriter clasps onto the tail of an idea and he reels it in and puts it down, he either reels it in and puts it down as it is and ought to be, or you damage it somewhere in the process. And the best songs are undamaged. That's how I see it. And everybody knows that. It's like, it's inherently so. Let me let me put it a little bit here and see. Like, this is a song to me that has a lot of potential, but I'm having trouble pulling it out undamaged. I can't figure out how to structure it. I, I can't figure out how to tempo it. And I think it may be missing a part. But I, I really like chord progression, and uh, I really like the uh, the ID, the melody over the chords. Thank you. 
Was I supposed to be like, I'm tuned? It's, uh, it's supposed to be a song, isn't it? Yeah, it's supposed to be a song that's an example of a song that is a, I believe, is an excellent song that I can't get to display to others its own excellence. Would you record it in a high quality or would that reduce the sentiment no, no, of the song? That's what I'm trying to do is figure out a way to record it so that I'm happy with the way it sounds in general. If I, like, the, the way I play the chords on the chord progression here now is very different than I play. I can play it better now. I know how to play it. And so. Uh, before I was, I couldn't play the same at the same time. Before it sounded like this. But... I mean, it sounds off tune, tune to me. So I, that's the thing, I don't want to talk about that. Yeah. I like that time, 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 time as well. Right. Well, from a songwriting so 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 standpoint, it sounds like, like what's in there is the chorus. It's, it's, it, in, in essence, essence, the bass, the bass line, line in, I mean, you played me something, you played that song for me uh, a, a couple of days ago, and it was tighter. It, it was more, uh, it had more development behind it than what's in that video. That's a, but what's early, in the video. that's a very early like rendition of it. Obviously, that's not just, the chord progression goes like this. So it's songwriting wise, what I would what I would suggest is to invert those. That what you're calling the chorus, think of that as the verse and vice versa, and work because choruses have a certain quality to them, and and what you're calling the verse has a chorus quality to it, and vice versa. Um, the bass line is is hinted at. I can already hear what you're what you're getting at bass line wise. Uh, um, there's, there's no, no bridge. bridge. I, I think what that's I have the only thing is a bridge in a chorus, and I need a verse. 
what you're, what you're calling, calling the chorus, chorus there, there, I would approach, approach that, that from a verse uh, uh, angle. But see, this seems to me like a bridge. I know. I know. It could be. You it could, it could be, but you don't have a verse. verse. I know. I need a verse. Yeah. Then, I think. That's what I'm saying. Is I think yeah. you're yeah. right that the chorus, the thing you're calling the chorus, should, ought to be considered the chorus, not the verse. And yeah. that yeah. the the other part there is kind of like a seems more like a break to me because I can't imagine starting the song with. I know. You told me. What if? I, maybe it could work as a verse. I don't it, know. It, it could, it could be either, either but. Whether, Whether it's, it's a verse or a, 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 a bridge, bridge is contextual. But having, having a, a chorus quality, what, what, what you, you were, were initially, initially calling a, a verse has a, has a chorus, chorus quality, quality to it. Okay. So, I'll arrange so, it. so my, my, su yeah, my, yeah, my suggestion would be to approach that, that as the verse, verse what you're building to, or as a chorus, what you're, chorus, what you're building to with the first verse, or it could be two verses before the chorus. And because. The other, the other way, way around, around what, what you were calling the chorus is anticlimactic compared okay. to what, to what you were calling the verse. verse. Okay. All right. That's that's Excuse good me. advice. Thank you, Jeremy. I will do just that. I will try and burden him and see. I think I can already tell in my head. I'm already feeling things. Hearing is working much better in my head. So I think it's going to make a substantial improvement. It's just turning, just switching the order of it. Yeah, yeah, you, you should build up to the chorus, chorus and, and then at the next verse, come down, 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 down a little breathing room, then build back up to the next chorus, chorus and then the bridge twists it a little bit, bit throw something, throw something in there that, that, that differentiates it a little bit, and then you can either do another verse and a chorus or go back into the, you know, there's no actual structure. It's like just a third chorus to end it quick that way. Yeah, I good idea. Thank that, you. It doesn't, it doesn't have, to have to be like stone rigid. rigid. Your choruses can differ one, one to the next, next if you want. It's whatever, whatever you want to do. do. But, as but as far as the inherent quality, quality of those two elements that you're, you're, showing, you're showing me, what you, what you would call the verse really, really should be the chorus, what you're, what you're building, building to. to. I think you're right. And you can even use, and there's a lot of examples of this, you can use the same chord progression for verse and chorus and have different melodies over the top of those. That happens a lot. I do have another melody for that main chord progression part. It goes, 1989, I was 18. That one, which I probably, I was trying to incorporate that too. I could use that as like a bridge or something. Maybe. I'm not sure. But yeah, that's <laughs> effective bridges. Even if you use the same, same chord progression for the verses and the chorus, but use different melodies and, and, and whatnot to, to constitute them, them good, good bridges tend to shake, shake it up, up somehow. There's, There's something, something different that, 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 that is occurring, is occurring in the bridge, bridge that, that, that distinguishes it from the other, the other parts of the song and, 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 and kind of puts the listener just, just a little. little um, makes it interesting. Uh, that seems to be what distinguishes a bridge from a verse, for, for instance. But a chorus is just the high point. That, that, those are the, the moments of plateaus that build, build up to. And, and breathing room for the next verse, and bang, back up to your plateau for the next chorus. Courses should be the high points. And when you started with as a quote unquote verse, a higher point than what you were calling a chorus after the fact. Um, you know, and I do have, I have a number of songs where I don't really have a proper second part either. You know, there's some of which are songs and progressions that I think, you know, I like a lot, but they just don't really have a chorus. Like, you know, Carl's Had Enough, it's got two guitar parts that go well together, but it's got no, no other... No, no second, no part that's not together, you know, like no second section. And that's a frustration for me because I don't know how, once I've been sort of like forced it into a, a form where it doesn't have a second section, then it's hard for me to go back to it and sort of revisit it as a writing thing and 
come up with a second section, or it, I don't know. I've got all these sort of like not very well arranged or not quite complete compositions or not fully realized compositions that are little songs that I'd like to take some sections from and cut off other sections and sort of rewrite them into good songs because they've got some good parts to it or whatever. Yeah. I really need to devote my energy more towards that than coming up with new stuff because I've got so many good ideas in some of those and, and good songs that I just I don't even know how to play them and you know it's it's part of the problem of being NE. It is a runaway with you. Anyway, I'm going to stop this live stream now. Thank you for watching. We got far off course from the topic of anger, but it's been a great conversation. I've been very much enjoying the company of all in attendance, talking with Jeremy, Neptune, uh, Kaiser chimed in a bit, and uh, who was here? Oh, yeah, that's right, Kestrel. How can I forget Kestrel? He has erotic nightmares, and that's <laughs> kind of unusual. So thanks for watching. Don't forget to eat plenty of cheese, and if you do forget to eat plenty of cheese, I want you to slap yourself as hard as you can.